really excited to, to end the conference. So I had a great conference. Hope everybody else did too. Um, when I get down, I'll see who's in the audience. So most of you, it was a pleasure. So <clears throat> when I first joined Keysight, my incoming manager asked what I knew about the company. And I said, oh, very little. And she quickly responded by saying, OK, I'll have you talk to some people. So the first gentleman I, I spoke with, he, it was very mem memorable for me. Because on the phone call, he said, well, what do you know about our company? And I was like, to be frank, I've used your products when I've been doing experimental quantum physics. I don't really know much about your company or, or anything like that. And he said, OK, we're more HP than computers. And that really struck with me. Because when I think of HP, all I think about is computers. But when you go back in time, Keysight, our bloodlines really go back to Bill and Dave in the garage in Silicon Valley. And their first product was an audio oscillator. So the kind of test and measurement equipment that Keysight still lives on today with. Um, our first customer was Walt Disney Studios. And our little piece of adding to the pie was um, enabling the first uh, movie to not only be recorded in stereo sound, but deployed. So if you're familiar with stereo versus mono, big jump. Where are we today as a company? So we're more than 14,000 employees. We're in over 100 countries. Uh, we have more than 20 R&D centers of excellence. We're on the S&P 500, which tends to surprise people because most people haven't heard of us. Um, had a great year, and we've been outperforming the can't see that, but we've been outperforming the index, so we've been doing fantastic as a company. So long bloodlines, doing well, financially stable, consistently a buy. And then who's the team that I represent? So I'm from the quantum engineering solutions team. We're an industry focused, our industry's quantum, no real shock, we're at a quantum conference. What we are for a company that's more than 14,000 people are the pathfinders for quantum. So questions that I get on a daily or weekly basis are, hey, I read this quantum thing. Does that matter to 5G? Does that matter to aerospace defense? Is this going to ruin encryption? And usually it's either an email explanation or a phone call to kind of walk them through it and kind of let them know when they need to start worrying about it or how it might fit into them. Our group in total has been around for more than seven years. Uh, I mean. This week, I've heard talks going back to Niels Bohr. So we're nowhere near that 100-year mark, but our group's been around for a while. We have more than 25 quantum scientists and engineers. We've enabled well north of 500 papers by quantum scientists and engineers using our products to, to be successful. That's really what matters to us. Uh, the hallmark of whether or not we're doing a good job is, are our customers successful? That's, that's one of the questions I get asked a lot, is how successful are we making other people? And then we've signed six MOUs. Uh, one of them was announced this week. We'll get to that at the end. And then we have, our, we have three quantum R&D sites um, making up our team. So a question that I've gotten a lot this week is, OK, I don't know much about Keysight. Haven't heard of your company. What do you guys do in quantum? So things that people do know is that we aren't putting a quantum computer on the cloud. So we aren't an IBM. We aren't an Oxford Quantum Circuits. We aren't a Rigetti. We aren't a QERA. Name your quantum hardware provider. For me, the way that I tend to explain it is in a gold rush, we're the people that are selling picks and shovels to the people that are going out to try and change the world. And that's really our kind of mindset. We have a very clear focus on who people are, we empathize with what you're trying to do. My background is a PhD quantum scientist. Many of our team is. Um, we've all intentionally made the choice to go to Keysight because we were, quite frankly, frustrated that the products that we needed didn't exist. So it's like, OK, if nobody's going to do this, then I will. OK, so an example of this, which probably uh, will be a bit different for what you're normally used to at this kind of conference. There's the question of how do you design a quantum computer? Not how do you use it, not how do you theoretically design it. If you're using any sort of 
semiconductor structure. So whether it's superconducting, uh, NV diamond, carbon nanotube, spin qubit, there's an open question on how do you actually lay out the different pieces of metal so that you're going to have something that functions as a quantum computer. And part of the way that you do that is using electronic design automation tools. So these are tools that are electromagnetic simulators that are used by people to make sure that the resonance frequency is right, that the coupling strengths are right, because the coupling strengths are going to set the two qubit gate times. On the left is an example that we've come out with today. So this is for a quantum limited amplifier. If you're using a superconducting system, the output signals are really small. They're only a couple microwave photons, which uh, is really, really tiny in terms of the signal si size and strength. So you need a very special amplifier. So we have tools out there on how to design these. This is something that for a long time was more, um, let's say art than science. So it was very much like an oral tradition among scientists on how to do this. Very few people knew, not well spread out through the world. And then next year, we're going to finish uh, integration into Kiskit Metal. So this is a project that we've been working on for more than a year. Kiskit Metal has over a thousand active users, all trying to design quantum hardware. And we're going to be plugged in there to help speed that up. Another place that we fit in is cryogenic component characterization. So, um, let's see, what's the most, what's the biggest thing here? So, uh, I would say the biggest challenge with cryogenic components is how long it takes things to cool down and warm back up. So, if you make a mistake, you lost several days. Uh, if a cable's not right, if you're not getting the right signal integrity, there's going to be a lot of challenge. So we've been working very closely with our partners, such as Blue Force, on how to do in situ cryogenic calibration. And this is also that you have much more stable, much more robust um, gate performance. So this is kind of one of those practical matters that needs to be done, but uh, when you're using a cloud platform, it, you just don't even know that it's there. It's kind of like the garbage men of the world. Then this summer, we came out with a new uh, fully digital quantum control system. So this right here is an ASIC that was designed, developed all in Silicon Valley. So we have a team of high-speed design ASIC engineers. And they came out with a custom chip for quantum to enable scalability. And then if you actually stop by our booth or anything else, those chips are all inside of here. So it makes it so that it's really high density, it's really scalable, it's digital. It's kind of like the difference between a record player and CD, uh, if you think about it that way. Um, something that we introduced, it's starting to really get adopted by the community, people really excited about it. A consistent challenge is most quantum physicists aren't RF engineers, so they don't really appreciate the difference between digital or analog. When you start showing them the signal quality and the performance, they get it, but there's a little bit of a mismatch. So our company is usually, oh, sorry, touch the mic. Our company is mostly RF engineers, so there's a little bit of communication mismatch. And I'm used to this because I've worked with nuclear scientists, I've worked with, I've worked in the semiconductor industry, I've worked with high energy physicists. People have the same concepts, they just don't vocalize it the same way, so that it, it takes a little while to get on the same page. Where this is going is a fully integrated quantum operating system that runs on our control solution. So right now, we have a pulse sequence API. Uh, more than a year ago, we acquired a company called Quantum Benchmark that is a gate-based, open chasm compatible uh, programming language, and we're in the process of integrating that, so that'll come out next year. Um, and then this will be a really powerful platform because now anybody that jumps into this will have something that will just immediately make experimentalists happy because they usually work at the pulse level. And then where it'll be very neat and novel is it'll allow for <coughs> better collaborations with theorists. Theorists tend to reason at the gate level so they can even use it. And then do things like bring in um, education workforce. So if you think about a lot of the education workforce materials that are out there, 
like Qiskit, a lot of it is geared towards the gate language. In terms of partnerships, one that we had this fall that we're really proud of was uh, with Rigetti Computing. So <clears throat> we announced a beta this fall of integrating our error diagnostics and error mitigation tools into their quantum cloud service. So we have a suite of tools that in the next few slides I'll show in action that we're first piloting with a small group of customers that have a very clear need for this. And then, provided everything goes well, we'll open it up to the, to the full uh, Rigetti customer basis. Standard thing of start with a couple people, make success, move forward. This is one example, not on Rigetti, but this is an ongoing collaboration uh, with QEDC. So we're one of the original founding members of QEDC, been working with the QEDC uh, tech on benchmarking. So last year around this time, QEDC came out with some application-oriented benchmarks. I've seen some more work this week on people kind of uh, doing a deeper dive into that space and, and really kind of going home. And this is something that I really like to see. So when I was in the high-performance computing industry, there was very well-defined algorithms and, and applications that you would benchmark against to know whether or not something was what you wanted to buy. So this is an example of just using randomized compiling to improve <coughs> performance on um, an IBM system and then looking at it as, as a function of qubit size. And part of this is to serve as a highlight reel for our team. They've been working so hard throughout the pandemic. Everybody's a little bit burnt out and I just, I'm so thrilled with the work that they've done that I just wanted to show it to everybody. So sorry that this is a bit of a higher light reel. This next one is with NC State. This, NC State is a IBM quantum hub. So this is using some, some other uh, error mitigation tools that we have. So on the previous side, you saw randomized compiling. Um, this summer, we came out with a more sophisticated error mitigation scheme called Knox. We have some papers on it, but this is something that's performance pr improvement demonstrated on up to 20 qubits in IBM system. So you can look that up if you want more details. <clears throat> this is our kind of latest and greatest. So where Quantum Benchmark started was error diagnostics. Oh, perfect. Error diagnostics. So if you have a few qubits looking at the correlated errors, anybody that's run algorithms knows that correlated errors are um, for multi qubits is, is a pain point. Uh, this, which is going to come out in, uh, with a new paper, is uh, a way to use that informed um, uh, crosstalk. That's the word I was looking for. How did I forget crosstalk? Looking for crosstalk uh, so that you can uh, decrease the net error rate on the different Clifford op operators and you can use that on other gates as well. But that's some of our latest. This is an example of moving a little bit further down. So I've intentionally started at the very top and moved our way down the stack. So this is an example of mitigating crosstalk at the, at the pulse level. So this is basically a procedure that uh, does real-time optimization of, of the phase of a signal. So this is why a digital signal matters because digital, you can go down to like, 73 nano Henry's of precision, it's really stable, and you can basically mitigate uh, a lot of errors. So there's a lot of good papers that our team has come out with on this. It's pretty scalable for single qubit. And then, as I mentioned, uh, yesterday we announced that with IQM, we are partnering to help deliver on-premise HPC compatible quantum systems. So. Uh, this is something that I've been interested in a long time because I have a history of working with supercomputers. Uh, really getting that close on-prem um, scientific discovery and enablement uh, easier. So the more widespread quantum is, the more people that are using it, the easier it's going to be for innovation. And then the wrap up, hopefully I'm not over. So the first thing is we aren't afraid of the cold. So I've been hearing a lot of talk about quantum winter. It may or not, may not be coming in. It could also be slowing down. 
right? Like the economy slowed down a little bit, doesn't mean the world's ending. But for us, we have a reliable business model. We can weather the bad economic storms. Um, when inflation started going up high, a lot of the senior leadership, what did they do? They called up the people that were managing back in the 70s to find out what worked. Uh, so we have a, a deep well to tap there. The, last, the second is we're focused on the software and hardware quantum infrastructure tools to accelerate innovation and decrease time to success. As I said, our real figure of merit is are we making other people successful faster? That's all that matters at the end of the day. If we aren't doing that, then we aren't providing value. And then the last one is uh, looking to provide high value selective partnerships. So the quantum community is big enough that we could partner with everyone, but then it doesn't mean much. And really what we're trying to do is create partnerships driven by the needs that keep coming up to us. So if five or six people come up to us and keep asking the same thing and say, hey, it would be great if you offered this as a product, then we start really taking it serious as maybe we should move forward. So a lot of our partnerships are, are coming from uh, the market. So people like yourselves saying, hey, this is what we need to be successful. So thank you for your attention.